Thank you for coming. Welcome. This should work. Just making sure everything goes over. Perfect. All right, we got everything good to go. If I can just get likes in the stream, just to confirm you guys can hear or see me, that'd be fantastic. I get everything set up and good to go. What a crazy week last week in the market. Should be fun to go over. I just always like to be the first. I'll type in chat here just so. Right, if anything else comes in, that's me right there. I'll be posting any links or anything that I'm sharing in there and throughout. Uh, all right. So if you guys are new here, essentially this is my live stream that I do once a week at least. Planning on doing a little bit more in the future. How's it going? See some hellos in the chat coming in and everything. Perfect. Um, yeah, so what we do here is just sit down, uh, basically the, the same stuff that I do for Stats Edge Pro every day. You guys get to see one day a week of that. Let's go, Michael. Um, and, you know, I basically just go through, we're gonna go through crypto, we're gonna go through Forex, we're gonna go through equity markets, the overall equity markets. We're gonna go over commodities. We're gonna go through all of the different um, ETFs that I watch. We're gonna look at what the watch list that I have on the go looks like right now. We're gonna scan for some additions or, or subtractions to it based off what the market looks like. And uh, then if you guys want at the end, I'll go over any charts that you guys are interested in. So if you're interested in you know, any kind of names, just save those and know that I'll ask for that at some point. As always, I like doing these as a live stream so that I can have user feedback and interaction. Otherwise, I'd just do a video. So if you got any questions along the way, like, hey, you know, why did you draw that trend line there? Why do you think this way about that market or think that way about that market? Just post it in chat and uh, I'll go through all of that, guys, for you. And again, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for leaving a like. I get a cool little animation of my new streaming program here, but let's just pop right into uh, the charts right here. And we're gonna start on the crypto side of things. Oh, I forgot to do this last week, but I'll do it this one, is um, reviewing any of those short videos that I made. And I think I only did one last week. I think something came up on Sunday and I just didn't have time. I think. Yeah. Oh, and that was just ACAD. ACAD was the only video I made last week. And it's basically, I'm just looking at this uh, giant rounded bottom here on ACAD and then this little bit of a pullback. If you draw an anchored VWAP at the very bottom of the move, you can see we've been above that for a while and we're pulling back into it. So. Uh, that was the theory behind that. No trigger yet. I kind of want to see a a close above this. I'm actually going to change this to candles. I'm starting to like the bar charts. Uh, just the um, it's the best way to put it. I don't want to say simplicity of them, but it takes out you know coloring and all of this stuff. It just makes it a little bit cleaner. So I may be switching over to bar charts. All the same information, right? High, low, open, close. I just think they look a little cleaner. Yeah, so ACAD, I'm looking for kind of a close, you know, call it above um, probably 23-ish to be to be easy, but at least uh, 2250. Yep, that's probably your conservative. Haven't gotten a close up there in a while, so nothing happened with that. How's it going? Digging the new streaming service. I know it's like, I've been using OBS for so long, which, you know, all the credit, it's free, it's open source, all this, but I figured it's you know, time to step up the game. Want to do a lot more streaming in 2022. Um, so we will go into crypto uh, first. I always like to start with that. And really, uh, we just got to take a look at Bitcoin, right? Because everything, there's not too much to add. Uh, again, you'll see me um, take screenshots of these periodically because all of the charts that I go over, I go over about 150 charts 
at least a night. It's probably in the neighborhood of two, 300 when I think of it. And then the ones that are the most interesting to me is what I take a screenshot of and I upload that to, to the Stats Edge Pro stuff. So I just wanna make sure I've got all that ready. And again, that's the pro members, what saves you watching these streams and you get it every day instead of just once a week. Okay, so Bitcoin, you know, looking at Bitcoin, it, it kind of is, as long as we're below 41,000, I don't think this is a long, you know, it, until we can get back above that, that would be kind of the first line in the sand that I'd say, listen, we have to retake this in order to get any sort of sustained bull run. Now for trades, you know, maybe if it gets to 30 and it starts to bounce, you could take a trade off that or something, but below that i'm not super excited and then i just look at this as a pretty bear flag looking look going on here just in bitcoin right we're getting tighter uh, it's moving up slowly you know it's barely it's not even getting up to resistance it looks like it might be failing before that so i just i'm not overly bullish about this right now. As you guys know, I took a little bit of a short um, over under this 40,000 area. It seemed obvious. And the thing I like about trading crypto is that the stuff that seems obvious actually works more often than not. Whereas, you know, equity markets are a little bit choppier, I think. I'm still, you know, I told everyone last week I got out of a large majority, I think like two thirds when it sold off, you know, I'm not going to leave that percentage gain on the table without doing anything. So I took a bit off. If this bear flag breaks down, I may re-add some of that, see if we can get a push down to 30. It's kind of my plan on Bitcoin um, as it stands right now. Hey, Sam. So that's kind of what I, the way I'm looking at it. You know, we could get some decent continuation. Obviously, a lot of support at 30K. If we break 30K, uh, JC was saying 14 was his target, and I don't, I don't think that's unreasonable. The odds that, you know, everyone's saying, you know, 20K, which was the high back here in 2017, I think we bleed through that, right? It, it doesn't seem like that's a very strong point could be if we started to see some patterns down there maybe but i think we're probably going to you know go back in this four, 14 or so if we sell off and we get scary like that that's when i may go bottom fishing for a little bit of a long term longer term play but when it comes to the daily chart just looking for the next little bit i'm looking for this bear flag to break down to add to a short position see what happens if and when we get to uh, 40 Save that. Uh, going through the list of different cryptos, we'll go through some. Um, was looking at this ASX coin. Again, I don't know anything about these. I trade them purely from a chart point of view. Interesting area, right? We have a zone here. That's also here. And then we're kind of hitting that as well. And that's a pretty wide zone. You're talking like 50 to 47. As long as we remain above that, if we start to kind of break this downtrend line, then I think you could be you could be onto something. You take that line. If you break that, maybe that'd be a point of recovery in through here. But uh, it's just you know it's not a, the hugest level I've ever seen, so I'm not super interested in that. And really, not many of them look amazing, right? I'm trying to find. Like in everything, you're trying to find relative strength. You know, when they hit the markets, what didn't they hit? And uh, helium is one of those. So I kind of like this helium just because the bleed through these prior highs, the support zone, was very, very quick. And it regained very, very quickly. So that's one that is interesting to me. However, I don't think, I'll go check again, but I use Kraken. I don't think it's listed on the Kraken exchange, so I don't know if I can get involved, but I would be interested maybe over 30 for a little bit, and then if we get above 35 for a little bit more. But again, I just don't know if I have access to it, but Binance uh, did for sure. 
And it could have changed. Last time I checked on Kraken, it wasn't there. It doesn't mean it's still not there. Yeah, and really that's about it. There's not really much else to say from the crypto world. I think it's one of those that it's, everything's gotten smoked. And now we need to see what's gonna happen after everything's gotten smoked, right? So this um, ENJ USD, something I've been following for a while. I wanna see it, if we put in this big round of bottom right here, is what I'm watching. Very interested on this. I think this is one of those video game coins, maybe. I don't know. And now it's putting in this kind of extended pullback in through here. So if this thing can get going, uh, that's interesting to me. That would be just a really big uh, cup and handle look. But it's a long way to do that. It could just break out, I guess, and go, but I see it kind of chopping around in here for a while first and then going. So that is something that I'm watching, but you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not pumped when I look at that chart anyway. So now we'll go into the Forex stuff. And I always like to start Forex with UUP, which is the dollar index. So if anyone doesn't know, UUP is essentially just a basket of other currencies, right? So it's versus the dollar. So there's a little bit of yen, a little bit of pound, a little bit of Canadian, a little bit of Aussie, a little bit of sterling, all this stuff. So it's a good overall, how is the US dollar doing feel? And, you know, so far so good, right? It's a uh, big round of bottom here. It did a little bit of a fake out under support here, but actually held my little support zone really well right at the bottom and then bounce from there. So good looking cup and handle pattern. You know, next little bit I see is up here kind of like 2650. Obviously this thing doesn't move very much because they're represented currency. But you know, there's, um, dollar's been bullish for a while, just broke out of a very bullish pattern. So if you're trading any cross pairs, just know that, right? We'll save this, and so there's a few, yeah, there's a few trades that I have on the go. One is this Euro USD, which I've been talking about for a long time in the in the pro membership. I've been making sure I include this chart. I think in every single one, and it's just right big round of top. Looks kind of exactly the inverse of the UP, and a lot of that I think is without. I don't know the weightings offhand, but I bet Euro makes a big deal when it comes to the UUP. So we'll keep that in mind there. So I am short this one. Uh, I scaled out a little bit at these prior lows. I, I took the short of this uh, descending triangle kind of look after this big round of top. So it's basically an inverse cup and handle. And I like the look of that one. I always like to monitor USD CAD just because I get paid in uh, US dollars for everything I do as a Canadian. So for me, I would love a very weak Canadian dollar. And this is something that's kind of interesting to me because over the last few days, the, the Canadian dollar has gotten weaker. And the reason that that's interesting is because our economy is mostly financials and oil. And as we go through the ETFs that I watch, those financials and oil, I had the oil especially has been doing great. So with our dollar being mostly oil and oil doing fantastic, you would think that our dollar is doing well. But um uh, someone just put nearing resistance. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But yeah, you would expect a kind of positive move in the Canadian dollar. However, it doesn't seem like that's the case right now. Um, the US dollars, the strength is just really kind of crushing it when it comes to everything else out there. And most cases, it's kind of the same thing. So I've been shorting this pound off of VWAP for a while. You can see a handful of them going on here. And this is just the anchored VWAP from the all-time highs here. It's been a great trade. But basically the dollar, when it comes to Forex, the dollar strength is just outweighing 
everything else, right? So all of these charts are just moving because the dollar is strong. So think about that. So we're going to go over into FX, but first I'm going to sit down. So one second here. Sorry, there I was almost getting out of breath from standing. Ugh, I just spent hours shoveling a very icy driveway, so uh, I do what I can. There we go. Ish. I know I'm not centered, but oh well. Yeah, so we, when you're looking at the dollar or you're looking at any cross pairs, just know that, you know, it's your cross pair is not moving because that pair is fine. It's because the dollar is weak. So from there into the equity market. So um, one trade that I took, and I don't really trade ETFs too often, but this one almost seemed, I hate the word obvious, but I'm kind of treating this as a bit of a longer term trade. So I could use, you know, maybe weekly charts would be a, a, the best way to represent it. Um, and for me, right, it's a trade's always a trade's always a trade, regardless of whether it's a longer term trade or a shorter term trade or a day trade, it's still a trade, which means that I have an entry, I have a stop loss, I've calculated my risk based off that entry and stop loss. Right, so it's just a trade like anything else. But what I do a lot of, if it's a longer term trade, I just, my stop's probably gonna be further away. So I just trade smaller, right? I still have all that in place. But I've been uh, short gold since, I wanna say 170, 170, 171, I gotta remember. And it's basically just, you know, I hate talking about fundamental stuff, but my, the thought process I'm going through is that we're in the, um, we have more inflation now than we've ever had, ever. Um, well, since I've been alive anyway, I think 1982 or something, there may have been more, and gold can't rally. And the, you know they've pumped up money into the system, dollars, and gold can't rally. And the market just fell like 10% in two weeks and gold can't rally. So if in this situation, which you would think would be the best one out there for gold, it can't rally, then I feel like I need to be short. So that combined with we've got anchored view app from all time high holding us down here, we have this downtrend line holding us down here. And we have this kind of uh, wedge pattern. I took a short in through here. If we can't break this wedge and we kind of bounce up and break out of this wedge to the upside, that's where I'm wrong. It's time to get out. If we break down this wedge, then I think I could get a pretty decent percentage gain, you know, down to like, I don't know, 143, 145 over time in, in this area. But that's just my thinking is, you know, if gold isn't going to rally now, when will it? Right, and I don't think it's um, I don't think it's one of those things that again I don't trade fundamentally. I like the technical pattern, but it's just in my mind I just can't reconcile the fact with you know you'd think we would bounce now, right? You think gold as the inflation hedge if it's not a inflation hedge and it doesn't do well in a commodity super cycle which we're in, then you know, what's going on, right? Where's the rest of the world going? So yeah, I've had this note about unstoppable oil for a long time, a little bit of a pullback, then it continues. Oil's just been an absolute monster. However, um, So I'm just looking at these topping tails here now on gold over the last, uh, oh, close enough. 
um, over the last handful of days here, you can see every time we get into this area, we put in a topping tail. So maybe it's going to be a time for a little bit of a short term reversal into this area, get down to kind of 58 or whatever. That would be interesting. Um, this line that it's bouncing off, I'm not really a big fib guy, but this line in here that's bouncing off of is about a 50% move from when oil went negative there to uh, when it went uh, its highs before 2020. So that's kind of interesting to me as well. Uh, you know, I wouldn't fight this trend. Like, it's not like I'm saying you should take a short up here if you're a scalper, maybe. But it's more of the fact that if you owned a lot of oil stuff and you're seeing some of these topping tails, uh, maybe, and I'll add this to the note, you know, might be time to lighten up. I use fibs, why don't you like them? I just, it's not that I dislike them. I just don't, I haven't found value in them in my trading is probably the best way to put them. If you have in yours, if they work as a, as a good little area, then that's great. I've just tried and it, it seems to be one of those, uh, it's too easy to, I don't wanna say like fudge the numbers, but you know, you draw it from one high and maybe that doesn't fit perfectly and then you choose another high and it's kind of, to me, the same as moving averages, right? People use the 10 period moving average and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't and then they'll say, okay, well, okay, it broke the 10, so now I'm going to look at the 20 and it broke the 20, now I'm going to look at the 50 and it broke the... So it just seems like a sliding scale. I'm more of a, um, you know, I want more concrete Right, like I've no, for me anyway, I've noticed looking at topping tails and bottoming tails, interesting. I've noticed, um, you know, looking at uh, anchored VWAP, interesting. Overall trend is interesting, but again, if it works and it's part of your plan, that's great. I just haven't been able to figure it away in my in my time to make it something that I can use at a very a consistent basis. Is I best is probably the best way to put it. Like something that is. I know that I draw it from here to here, and then that will give me some um, consistency with it. And it might be my fault for not uh, going after it hard enough, but for me, it's, um, I just haven't found it consistent at all. So healthcare is interesting here, where we have this, uh, ooh, We have this bottom that it's holding pretty well in healthcare. So it might be time to look at some of those healthcare stocks again. Might be time for a little bit of a bounce if we can hold that area. I know XRT has been the hardest. I'm just going through all of these. And again, this is what I do every night. And I kind of pull out from there. Oh, I meant that no one brought this up in the live Q&A, even though I had this in the notes for a long time. But that's okay. Uh, so this, I'm not going to include this, but the XLE will kind of move with oil in most cases. But I wanted to point this out in the uh, the Q&A that we had last week for the, the pro members. But essentially what I was looking at is that this is why you focus on relative strength. Because as the market was tanking, XLE was doing fine. So by not trying to pick bottoms or trying to pick tops, but just buying strong energy names, you had a good couple of weeks out of that. And I go through, I know I go through a lot of these indexes, but see XLF holding strong. Yeah, we're gonna get a lot of good names here. So massive bounce in technology and look at exactly where that happened, right? Where Right where you would expect in this prior resistance, which is why I don't think if we have, if we're having like a real end of the world, um, I'm going to add this funny, that consumer staples, look at that anchored VWAP right at the bottom. But, uh, if the world was coming to an end, you don't think that the support zones would be, be treated as well as they are. Right? I remember in 2008, everything just kind of collapsed. 
So yeah, this is, okay. I'll put a note in here. So that's the 2021 to date AV app. All right, so this is the anchored view app of uh, 2021, uh, January 1, 2021 until, until now. With support here, and you can see it was really acting as a, a really strong support in this area as this stuff was going mad. At the same time, I wanna kind of point out this RSP was doing much, much better than the SPY. It's holding over these kind of September lows. And that's because I think what they're coming for next is uh, strong, um, the you know the strong names. So Apple was getting hit for a while there until they reported great earnings. A lot of these bigger ones. The RSP again, if you guys don't know, it's just an equal weighted index. So it's just showing you right here what the overall market is doing, and a much better job, in my opinion, than the Spy does. All right, if we look at the Spy, it's kind of the same thing, but those. Um, September lows, I guess, or those November lows, we broke substantially. So this is what I'm watching for in here. I'm just gonna go prior support. Because this is really kind of the crux of it in the main chart I wanted to rant about on a long, for a long time. And I think what we have to watch is this area up here used to be support. You can see in through here and here and resistance here. If we're gonna get this big bounce and Friday did feel like it's gonna be a big bounce day, this is where we have to watch this 450 area. And I was watching it like a hawk on the way down and we kind of just cut right through it. So on the way up, I think we also have to watch that as well. Right, it's a very significant level. If we can retake that, I think we're off to the races. You know, I think it's going to be really, really dependent on earnings. Um, and I always try to, again, I'm not a fundamental guy. I don't believe that you can just read the news and, and buy anything based off that. I just don't think the market works that way. But if we're trying to figure out why the market may bounce potential, potentially, the argument of are all the right hikes and everything already priced in? If they are priced in, then it makes sense that we could bounce here. At the same time, if companies continue to smash earnings the way they are with Microsoft having an insane quarter, uh, Apple having a great quarter, if companies are making money, that's obviously gonna be bullish for the overall market. So, you know, again, the people who will say uh, Fed manipulated blah 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 right just don't mute them on twitter right just what's going on on the charts to me it seems like we found a level right here that's kind of a do or die area i i told you at 450 i would start to become more cautious and when we broke 450 i did i you know only have a handful of positions on now and i'm, I'm picking them uh, as it goes i don't think this is you know a giant bear market coming there doesn't seem to be you know, a financial crash or a tech crash or a pandemic or any of the events that cause massive financial calamity, at least not yet. So as a technician, I just look at that as we are obviously in an uptrend. Right? Anyone who says we're not in an uptrend overall here just doesn't know charts, right? The chart is going from the bottom to the top. So, uh, the question is, in this uptrend, where's the best time to buy? Now, right, say, you know, time goes on and we break this level again, that will probably be the change of the uptrend. So the last bit of rant that I wanna go on is this is something, and the reason my website stats are trading, right, is because I look at the statistics of what happens during certain periods and then I use those statistics and I combine them with my you know, CMT and, and I've been trading for years and looking at charts for years and I combine those things, right? I, I combine statistics with technicals and that's how I come up with my trading decisions, right? So, um, so the way I'm looking at this is that bottoms are generally speaking V in nature. 
All right, you can go back to the end of um, 20, uh, 2008. You can go back to uh, all of the different crashes throughout the time. And um, they're all V-bottom in nature, right? Tops, however, are usually much more of a pain than that. They're usually, they'll take long periods of time and there'll be a lot of chop. And the old trader adage is that a bottom is an event and a top is a process. So what I'm saying right now is I don't see any reason that we're at the uh, like a long term top in the market. However, if we start trying to, you know, we bounce around for a while, then maybe. But more what I'm looking at, and, and this is just to say, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you're always so bullish. Well, I'm so bullish because we're in an uptrend. Right. As long as this pattern continues, we're going to be in an uptrend. What 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 makes me what will make me switch? And I'll switch my opinion on a dime because if you're not as a trader, what are you doing? Is that you know, say we bounce here and we fail to make a new high, and then we break that low. That will be the first official change in trend since the pandemic low. And that's where I'll go, okay, we're now in a short-term downtrend. It's time to worry, right? And you can draw this out all the way back to here. We're just making higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, and higher lows. And that is the definition of an uptrend, right? So if we fail, if we bounce, you know, say we bounce to 450 in this hypothetical scenario, and then we fail and that starts to break down and we break this 430 area, I'll go, okay, might be probably in a short term top. And that's when I'll say, okay, it's time to uh, clear the decks of any positions that I have, start to look for where the market uh, is displaying some relative strength and do some more short term kind of bounce trading, which is what I do more or less in more bearish uh, environments. So I know I let's catch up now that I'm done that rant. Uh, using fibs, moving average can manipulate to fit context. Yeah, I think I have the same opinion as you there, supply and demand, where it's just it's you know it's just a little bit too subjective. Now all trading is subjective. Where I draw my support and resistance line is subjective, right? A lot of this is objective. Just fibs seem like. Um, so that's why I'll do things like on USO, I was okay drawing a fib just because the bottom on USO is really, really evident and the top on USO is really, really evident. So if I can see a, right, it had like a V top and it had a V bottom there, I think you're kind of interested in, in doing that. But when it starts to get like a bit, if I have any question in my mind where I would draw a fib, then... I'm going to do that. And you notice the only line I have in there is the 50% line. To me, that just makes the most kind of um, statistical sense, right? Um, when you're looking left for resistance, what time should you focus on and how far should I look back? All depends on your time frame, right? On your time frame in particular. So I want to hold things for a week to a month usually is kind of how much I want to be in something. So I look back uh, about 90 days on average, maybe six months. But then if I don't see anything, I'll start to zoom out and just say, where is the next area, right? So maybe uh, let's just grab, you know, the SPY, for example, the RSP. I don't need to look at too much other than this data here because there's a clump of lows here and a clump of highs there. So there's nothing really, I don't care what happened ages ago. Now this is an all time high. So if we start to break out here, I don't care about that either. Uh, to me, it will be, you know, so say this breaks, we, we do what I was thinking, we bounce a little bit and we break, and I can't see any levels on my chart. So we're down in like the 228. Then I'll just zoom out and say, okay, where's the nearest level, right? Because I, my personal belief is that uh, the market is going to respect whatever the nearest level is in time uh, along with price so that it's going to, if you can see the level, a close level, like we always, you know, we've got a level up here and we've got this level down here. That's all I care about right now. When one of those are violated, if I can't see another level, I'll go back and, and look at that level. But 
you know, it's all about your time frame. If you're a day trader, you probably only want to look back a few weeks. If you're a long-term investor, you want to look back a few years. It's, it's going to matter a little bit. 2008 was large event version. I would not um, predict a crash, but if we get a long pullback, it should not like to. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Unless the event comes later, which is why I don't trade off news. Often the event comes after uh, kind of what actually is occurring, but I just don't see anything out there uh, that everyone's worrying too much about. Right now, the market seems to be focused on uh, the rates, right? So what are they going to do with rates? What are they going to do? When, when are they going to raise rates? How much are they going to raise rates? But it, again, the reason I don't trade news and I trade statistics and technicals is because my theory is that rates hikes are priced in now. Everybody knows that they're going to raise rates. They roughly have an idea of a time frame that they're going to raise them on. That's priced in, right? As soon as you know, the, the, stat, the stats edge guys will tell you my whole my whole rant of uh, if you know the news, everyone else knows the news, and it's already priced in. You know, it's never the thing that we see coming that causes the financial collapse. It's never that. It's always. Oh, there's a, a oh, sorry, move there. Um, yeah, it's never the thing that people see coming that causes the catastrophe. It's the unknown. It's the pandemic out of nowhere. It's the tech bubble that exploded. It's the and after the fact, there'll always be a few people that go. You know, I knew that was coming, but in the time, it's like, did you? Were you heavily short the market, and were you right? Because again, anyone who's shorted the market, except for someone who's shorted the market right here, has been wrong, right? And I, I know people, and I've seen them on Twitter, who are perma bears. And every time there's a downtick, it's different this time, and then it's not. And it's different this time, and then it's not. So until something kind of smacks us out of out of uh, left field, that's what I'm kind of worried about. So I use anchored VWAP a lot. It appears to act as resistance like you showed in the gold chart. How does this translate into market participant? What's happening in these cases? So uh, the anchored VWAP, and I see uh, your quote there, David, and I definitely, I'll go over IWM next, but um, the anchored VWAP and, you know, Brian Shannon from Alpha Trends is kind of the godfather of this, but it's essentially a, a tool that I'm now incorporating more and more into my trading uh, the more I see that it, it's power and it's essentially just so say if I anchor the view app from this all time high candle right here, it essentially will show you where the average participant is in um, in that market. So on average, every if you average out every trade that occurred in the RSP from all time highs till today, that average, the average market participant is around 157. So it's just telling you on average. So think of it your way. If you, if you, or think of it for yourself. If you bought uh, one share every time, uh, every day between what was this, the fourth and now, your average price would be about 157. So those average prices make more sense to me than moving averages that just equate time and nothing else. But it's basically saying that the average market participant, where do they exist? And the main reason I use them is to say, is the average market participant up money or down money or are they at a level they would defend? So we've all been there. We know we shouldn't be there. but We've all been there where we're like, hey, uh, I bought this stock and I'm just getting hammered on it. If I get back to even, I'm out. We've all said it. We know you shouldn't. Uh, but quite often, if there's enough people that want to do that, then that means that if something bounces and hits it's a VWAP, they'll get out. If something sells down and hits a VWAP, it will it will bounce as well, right? So, you know, if you look at Hood, right, how many people are going to be in this? And this is why I wouldn't be super interested in buying this. If you do an, um, an anchored VWAP from the IPO or from the highs, you're saying you know your average person's at 34. So there's so many bag holders in the stock that it needs to over double to get back most people's money. So it just means, hey, you know, maybe you could say 
that's a huge move. So I want to buy some hood here and I know that I'm going to have that overhead resistance coming, but it doubles worth it to me. So if I can buy it and, and, and you know, get it up a little bit and as time goes on, it will move as well. And it adjusts to volume, which I like as well. So um, request for the IWM. And of course we will. We're almost done our uh, ETFs and then we'll go into individual stocks as well. But ooh, yeah predicted the last yeah so that's not i just don't i just don't do that you'll notice nothing that i do here is predictions i do analysis and then i take trades right awesome have a good one enjoy your football just not a sports guy more of a math guy so uh, iwm is, is by far the most unnerving of the etfs that are out there I don't think that surprises anyone. If we go to even do that same uh, 2020 to date anchored VWAP, uh, roughly here, give or take, shouldn't matter that much. We're well under that. And that's because as even though the market climbed last year, IWM just got murdered, right? We know that the ARC funds got murdered uh, the same way. This is a very rotational heavy market. So IWM, I'm super nervous. Like this one, I just, there's my note. IWM looks like death. Uh, what I would say is that on, if we get a bounce, right, you're going to watch this at 211 area. If that bounce fails, you're watching these prior lows right here at kind of 188. Until then, I don't think there's much to do. I think you're just kind of you're stuck at is if this low holds it's great but i really wouldn't get involved too much until this breaks here breaks and holds which i really don't see it doing in one shot so i think we're going to get some chop on the way up now uh, the question always has to be how much do i care about iwm because this looks super bearish so when i'm doing my analysis i have to look at how much do i think iwm will matter and I really don't think it will matter much. There have been times in the past where um, the uh, market has rallied and small caps haven't. And small caps caught up way, 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 way later. So we could sell in the IWM and then um, we could bounce in the overall market. So that's it doesn't mean... Just because IWM is weak and I think it may go lower doesn't mean the whole market necessarily will. It will be a drag on the market and will make it harder, but I don't think that necessarily means that the market will will sell. Just there's been times in the past that would happen. Uh, and again, this is a very rotationally driven market, which I'll show you guys some examples, uh, which just means that if you've been in depend this market i hate the term it's a stock pickers market but it really is it depends where you are which kind of leads me to that next this next question right arc does it make any sense to do ta on etf that consists of hundreds of different stocks for sure like that's what the iwm and the spy is you just need to know the theme of that so when i look at the spy i know it's going to represent the overall market but heavily weighted to large cap names that's why i look at the rsp which is going to represent the whole market, but I know that that's representative of uh, large cap names, right? Because you need to be fairly large cap to get in the SP 500. If I look at the MDY, for example, uh, this is the mid cap, right? So their potential may be a bear trap in the MDY, but this is the mid caps. So it makes me say, okay, SPY is the strongest. So if I'm going to buy stuff, it makes sense to look in the large cap area second would be to look in the mid cap range and lastly the last stuff i should look at is stocks in the small caps just because this is the overall weakest so that makes sense as well so for example arkk you just need to know what the what technical analysis on this etf would recommend or or would uh, represent where if you're doing um, this on ARC, you're basically just, you have to know what she's investing in. And we all know that Kathy invests in growth names. So technical analysis makes perfect sense on these things because we know that if this starts to push, 
it means uh, growth names are, are starting to take off and maybe you find some growth names to trade. Uh, if this breaks down, we know that, which it did right here on this uh, line that I had, when it broke down, it means, okay, growth is out of favor. Let me get out of growth and into, right? This is a chart that I did all the time. Let's actually go over to uh, trade ideas for this. make that big and this is a chart that I've done a fair amount on oh get out of here um, don't worry that's not my real Forex account I showed that's just a a demo for something that I'm testing uh, this one so let's make this a daily chart and let's unlink it. All right, so we'll make this ARKK and we'll make this BRK. Come on, BRK dot B. Burke B. All right, so when you look at this chart, and these are for the exact same time frames. It kind of makes sense to you why you would do TA on this this type of thing because you can go, okay, well, Burke's breaking out and Arc is breaking down, so maybe I should start to look to invest in names that Warren Buffett would look at it, with large cash flows that pay dividends and and blah 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 and all this kind of boring stuff, and be out of names that Kathy would invest in. So. That's the main reason I don't really trade uh, too much when it comes to move, yeah, line that up a little better. Uh, I don't really trade too much when it comes to looking at the actual ETF. I trade some ETFs, you know, usually like gold or the spy or something like that. But for me, I do all of this analysis, everything that you've seen to date, I do every day just to get a feel for the market and what playground we're playing in, right? And that's where I think there's value in Stats Edge because all of these charts get uploaded into a blog post that I'll show you guys later every single night. So you'll get kind of my entire thoughts, each of these charts annotated like I showed you, just saying this is why I think of this. But again, what wouldn't make sense is just saying, hey, there's, you know, here's a technical pattern on it and I'm just gonna trade the ETF not knowing uh, what it represents, right? So just make sure you're you're kind of focused in that way. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of that where I focus a lot on. Let's actually add that. I want to add ARKK to this. Uh, speaking of ARKK, maybe is it time for a bounce finally on this one? Who knows? Uh, the only thing that I'm kind of looking at is this prior high right here. Maybe. But I think it, this day right here was the biggest volume day ever for ARC. And that held, right? The low of that held. Maybe we're going to get a bounce. But yeah, for me, this is a proxy of growth stocks. And, that, and that's kind of all it is, right? No, no problem at all. That's why I do these live. So we can get chats as well. So... Uh, for me, again, I think the best way to summarize my thoughts on the market is I don't see why it would be different this time. Doesn't mean it's it's going to be. I just think you live a way better life of trading with the trend than you do always trading against the trend. And you know, I know people that do it, and there's some people who make money doing it. I just think it's a much harder existence. I believe it was William O'Neill, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, who said over and over again that there is more money lost anticipating a correction than there ever is in the correction. So basically just meaning that the people who are selling because the market is overdone or this is a, uh, a f you know, um, fed fueled rally or you know the market is going wacky or whatever excuse they give 
And instead of just saying, we're in an uptrend, I'm going to continue to hold my stocks until that uptrend breaks, they're making life like way harder for themselves. And I think it was JC I was listening to. I was in a space with him the other day, and he was saying, if you can't survive a bull market, what makes you think you should survive a bear market, right? Um, so again, until this trend breaks, and really my line in the sand right now is this candle's low. If we close below this candle's low, I'm going to be okay. That will probably be when I'll get out of the rest of my longs, uh, unless they're still performing well, right? It's, I just, I keep what's working and I sell what's not. What's not, And that's probably when I'll get a little bit more defensive in stance. Uh, to do that, again, for me, it just comes down to shrinking time frame. I think a lot of people say, oh, if the market's going down, you just short it. And it just doesn't work like that. We know the largest rallies are in bear markets. That's just a, you know, a fact. Um, so a lot of people say, oh, if the market's going down, you just short it. Just like if the market's going up, you just buy it. It's, it's just doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. Um, the best way I have found to deal with incredibly volatile markets is just shrink time horizon. So what I'll start doing is I'll probably come up with some algos that are bounce type algos that I hold for one to two to three days. And at the same time, I make lists on uh, where is the strength. And then, because I know when the market turns, we can go into the strength as well, right? When war is rumored for so long, does it mean it's pricing? Yeah, probably. And also, um, and I don't agree with this, war seems to have a lot of people spooked. Who are those people, right? You know, a war obviously from a, a humanist is horrible and we should avoid it at all costs. But from a technical point of view, go look at the last handful of wars we got in and what that did to the market. Right. That's generally pretty bullish. Uh, take a look at UVXY. This is just the VIX. Right. So it's it's going to increase when the market is people are getting scared and it's going to decrease when it's not. I don't believe in doing really technical analysis on the VIX. It just doesn't make sense. It's a fear barometer. Um, it almost, the way I look at the VIX is it's almost an indicator. And just like you don't do technical analysis on an RSI or a MACD, I don't really do it on this. For me, it what matters is the level of the VIX, uh, which this being an ETF of the VIX, this is obviously a degrading pro product that you never want to hold for more than a few days. It's built that way. It's built to degrade. Here is a uh, $250,000 price, right? It just, it is meant to degrade over time. It's just the way it works and they just do reverse splits. It's gets in the whole derivatives thing. It's a little bit complicated. So if you're going to buy this just for a short period of time, do it. I would say never short this because it's an easy way to get completely blown out just because if something happens there's, and the market gets incredibly scared then you can have a really hard time with this. Uh, it's important to know that you, the VIX is simply saying um, how many people are buying puts on the S&P 500. That's the, that's the way to break down what the VIX is. So as it spikes, it just means more people are buying puts. As it, as it tanks, it just means less people are buying puts. That's why people call it the fear index, is how, many, how much are people buying insurance policy on their portfolio? Uh, so again, I don't really do technical analysis on it. Uh, I I like it as a short-term hedging tool. So if you're worried about, you know, say you have a big portfolio you don't want to sell, and you want to put a little bit into a a VIX or UVXY or whatever for a trade for a week or something, you're worried that you know the Fed's going to say something that's going to spook the market or whatever your idea is. You're just going to buy it and it's going to go. Then that's fine. Um, again, for me, it's more of an indicator, right? You can say uh, VXX, you can do more of a, uh, if the VIX, and this is what I'll see a lot of people, they'll do like what I did here is draw a line and say, if the VIX is above whatever you say, if the VIX is above 20, maybe I'm more of a short-term trader. And if the VIX is below 20, maybe I'm more of a long-term trader. Because again, it's just signifying how much volatility is in the market. Uh, pro shares must make a killing. They absolutely do. 
these markets are so money for them because there's so many people. Well, and also market makers and, and people who trade these things, not understanding what they are and hold them for long periods of time. And I know people who just didn't, they're like, this thing has to bounce at some point. It was way up here. Like, no, what happens is it just goes down over time. People just know it. Um, and there's people out there who buy tons and tons of the call options and they buy shares and all of this and the market makers taking the other side of their bet. They make a killing. Now, every now and then they're going to get smacked when it's reason why I say retail traders don't uh, short this thing because, right, something happens, a, a natural disaster, or something out of the blue occurs. All of a sudden, you'll this thing can triple or quadruple on you overnight very easily and you're having a bad time but the market makers are okay with that because they just have such deep pockets they will just you know deal with that uh, so it's it's again a great short-term vehicle and a great indicator however uh you know that's just the way it goes um but yeah i, just, I wouldn't spend too much time doing any other technical analysis than just the numbers on uh, the levels on it so now we're going to go into looking at individual my watch list. So if you're new to Stats Edge Trading, again, link is in the description below. Let's actually, oh, I'm not, I won't do that rant yet. Two more things I got to do first. One is what's the news? So this is forexfactory.com, no relation, but I always just grab this from here uh, and I just point out anything that I think could be news. Uh, Basically, what they try to do is they try to color code the impact of these things. I don't really agree with that in all cases, and sometimes I do. Uh, right, so the, the way I look at this is that, go done, um, and save. This just tells me what economic events are occurring. And sometimes you can get a bit of a cue from that because if there's like a big economic event on Tuesday, then on Monday you can expect chop. Things like that are important. So for example, there is uh, some big economic events on Tuesday. So Monday might be a chop. And I'll put that in my final notes. And then Wednesday is a bunch for the pound. Nothing really for us. What about Wednesday? Nothing really for the U.S. So a pretty light news day, but there's a lot of Fed talk next week and all eyes are on the Fed. So that'll be interesting. Then I always also like to go here, which is Coifin, also not affiliated. And I like to take a look at the sector analysis for the last five days. I keep forgetting to set up a, a scene on this one that I can remove myself, but Really nothing too much to see there going the last day. Still nothing to see there. Again, this is just the rel relative performance of each individual sector in the S&P 500. And sometimes there's little bits that you can glean from it if, you know, risk on or risk off or whatever. But yeah, so now we'll go through the watch list. So again, how if you're interested, a link's in the description below. Uh, free trading course you can check out 100% free. In, uh, get my face out of the way 39 lessons beginning to end no you don't need to sign in you don't need to do whatever it's all on youtube uh, my trading tools this is a, a way to support me if you're interested in trading as a trend spider both of which you'll see today uh, trader sync i'm setting up accounts with and i'm going to play with more and i'm going to do something cool with them in the future it's a nice journaling platform and journaling as a trader is very important uh, all of these links in here are all affiliate links, so they will uh, uh, support me as well. If you're so Stats Edge Pro, so basically what I've been doing all day uh, is take you behind the curtain here, right? So you get watch list analysis, you get access to all of the scans I use to find stocks I'm interested in. We have a chat. Nothing in here is a signal service, right? If um, it's one of those things where um, I don't believe in signal services, right? What I'm doing is I'm selling my research, not so much you, ideas. Um, there's our past Q&A webinar. Once a month, we have a Q&A webinar that usually go like two, three hours of me just answering questions. 
uh, live for just the, the pro members. And then we have this one, which I think is the main part of it, which is just the nighttime analysis. So this is the one for the 27th. And it's kind of everything that you take a look at uh, that you, you see here, right? So, um, you know, my thoughts on the market, I have all of the charts that I made just noted, right? So every night, <laughs> I do a lot of charts every night. Uh, just my overall thoughts on the market, I always write down and then you get access to this, which is just my watch list and I update this uh, every day based off of what I'm seeing in the market. So that's what I'm gonna go do now is I'm gonna go through. Um, I always do it in this order for the people who don't want, you're not interested in any of this, how you do this yourself. Well, you know, spend a lot of time looking at charts, but I always do my own analysis. I try to figure out what's out there on the market and then I go in from there. So for example, we determine that, uh, you know, the large caps, if we're going to see a bounce, we're probably going to see it in the large cap names. So a lot of these things you'll, you'll see are large caps, not all of them. I'll sprinkle in some stuff, but you know, that all of everything I've done for the last hour, I do every night and I do way more. I kind of shorten it for, for you guys, but it's just to get, okay, where are we looking? What, uh, what's Sean always says, what playground am I playing in? I think is the best way to determine it. And now it's time to look at charts and names. So, uh, CME I'm interested in very much just because it's holding these prior highs very, very well. Uh, anchor view app from Lowe's, it's holding, just putting in this kind of sideways market right here as the market's been selling. So some huge relative strength in CME, so I'll leave that on the list. Um, yeah, Trend Spider now has option flow on their charts. Yeah, that's what I've got right here. I haven't found a use for it yet, but you know, I'll play with it. Um, I don't, my thing with options is the way I look at it is that the guy who's selling the option is usually the smart money. And the guy who's buying it is not. So I don't know, it's more or less the way I look at it. Uh, Kroger, I'm going to leave on the list. It's holding uh, this zone, that uh, support zone that I drew very nicely. A little bit below this AV wet, but I'll need it above that before I buy it anyway. So I'm fine with that. Hard time a year or hard time a quarter for this with all of the earnings and everything out. Uh, Baker Hughes, I'm looking it for it to hold above these prior highs, which it just hasn't been able to. Uh, that one still looks fine. Got Planet Fitness here. I know this one still looks fine. I'm really interested to Planet Fitness to see if um, this goes, right? Holds this and this resistance level and then push up from there. Uh, BMRN, same kind of thing, right? Got holding support well if you look at these charts you can see the main theme of everything that i've been looking at since the spy has been selling is when i sit down i always I just ask myself one question when the market is selling and that's what are they not selling right what what are they just not what what don't they want to sell and that's what i'm going to focus on because when the market turns the stuff that they didn't sell is probably going to bounce the best so that one's holding hm uh, HC, I'm looking for it to hold this gap and that's holding very well. Uh, ACAD, this is one of my more speculative ones, but we went over this earlier, just a big rounded basin through here. And then a, if we push up, we'll push up uh, from here. SBG, same thing, right? Holding support. I wanna see this thing bounce, doing a little bit better than the market is. Uh, earnings are getting really close for this one, so that will get taken off the list soon. Uh, LYV, I got. A, I actually bought a bit of this, full disclosure, on a Friday. Uh, I just liked the bounce right off the Anchor View app, right off of support. Uh, I've got a little bit until earnings, so 20 candles, so about a month. Um, I just like that this held. My stop is very tight. If we get up to highs, then I'll be super happy with that. And FGen, I've been in this one for four or five days now. Big round at bottom, little cup and handle style pattern there. I should probably do the view app from here, actually. It's not gonna change it much, but let's be exact. And I just do it from the lowest low or the, the highest high or a gap are the, the three ways that I draw personally. I don't like to get too fancy with it. 
So everything from the watch list still remains, but I only have nine things on the watch list, so we can add some more. Um, so let's go into uh, trade ideas, which I do all of my scanning on and see what we can find here. I've got a scan for the Market Explorer, which I'm working on, and you guys should get uh, access to soon, but until then, I'm gonna snag it, but let's take a look what's going on up here. This in the pocket scan is a good one. Basically just looking for strong names pulling back, and sort it by short float, so I can find some. Oh, that's uh, properties. No, some linking. Green. There we go. Oh, uh, what symbolist do I scan? I scan everything. I want to see the entire market, and then I'll make my decision from there. I don't focus on. Now with Trend Spider, you have to, and it's kind of annoying because what I'll do is I'll scan, um, I'll I'll do the S and P five hundred, and then I'll do right. So I get a scan here, uh, pull back, and all these are on the site for uh, for members, right? These are the scans you have access to. But yeah, I'll do the if you go to their market scanner, that's probably a better way to do it trend pullback so yeah you have to go in and you've got to go okay uh, let's start with the S&P 500 and then you have to go into the other one you have to go into the other one that's the power of trade ideas where you don't have to do that you can simply go okay uh, let me just scan the entire market and and filter by volume or price or, or whatever you need to do and that's just for me it's a better way to way better way I well for everyone to be a way better way to do it which is again why I like to use both you know I like um, the drawing tools on TrendSpider way better I like the mobile alerting that TrendSpider has uh, Trade Ideas doesn't have crypto so I have to use TrendSpider for that but when it comes to scanning Trade Ideas just got them got them beat and at the same time with that not only do they have them beat in scanning, I also do all of my trading through trade ideas. So if there's a stock that I like or something, I can just click on a chart and, um, and away I go. Um, if you have limited time and you just want to scan through maybe one or two things, I would recommend find whatever uh, sector or um, index is strongest and scan through that. So right now that'd be the S&P 500, right? I, I, I could see it being perfectly logical of saying the IWM is getting killed. So, you know, let me just focus on the S&P 500 and let me just scan through the S&P 500 because then at least everything, if the market, or if the S&P 500 bounces because it's stronger, you can go and, and push from that, right? Yes, I've been using TI to scan and oh, TrendSpider chart linked to TI. Yeah, that makes sense. The only reason I like to keep mine separate out here is just because I'm a Mac nerd, so I can run the Mac version of things. It's kind of the best way to put it, but this WNC is interesting. Oh, where's one's earnings? This is where I get, yeah, this is the problem. This is one thing that I really love about Trade Ideas over Trend Spider 2. It's, it's probably the most underrated window, I think, in all of scanning is this single stock window. You get some basic news, but I don't really care about that. But uh, you can put anything you want in here. So if you want, uh, if you want, um, you know, earnings date, you can put that in. If you want fundamental filters, you can put that in, right? If you want uh, short floats, which is what I look at, you can put that kind of stuff in. And you just get a nice data sheet of whatever it is that you're looking for and say, okay, this is when. So I can look at ACAD, which I showed you guys in the other charts that I'm interested in and say, okay, well, there's the float. I can look at uh, market cap, right? And say, okay, that's a $3 billion market cap. So that's gonna be in the small cap. 
right? Earnings are this far away, and right, it's just quick at a glance, which is one of the things that I think makes trade ideas really powerful for scanning. Is I don't need to, you know, then go and look this up and see what's going on and blah blah blah. If I want to do the news, I can just click on it and read the news, see if there's anything out there. For me, the only time I'm really looking at the news is to see is there a corporate event, uh, is there you know, some sort of uh, corporate action is or a buyout or a merger or something like that, just so I don't get involved in that kind of stuff. But to be honest, I don't do it as much as I should. It's, per it's certainly possible that I don't find anything today, which I am kind of going into the market expecting uh, and go, you know, from that, right? Like there's nothing to me that's um, surprising that like I wouldn't be shocked if where this one um, yeah I wouldn't be sh shocked if I don't add anything to the watch list today like it's just it is what it is with this market right I don't want to oh, there we go. I wouldn't want to mess with anything and just try to put stuff in there. Uh, trade ideas more. Transpire more manual, but heavy, but still powerful. Yeah, and that's why, again, I think it all depends on, okay, where are you as, um, what's this one? I want it to run, not the other one. Uh, it all depends where are you as a trader. Right. And what do you do as a trader that I think you always need to customize your tools to it? So my tools are trade ideas, trend spider, and then I'm using that trader sync now and I'm starting to move my journals and everything over to it. So a journaling tool makes sense, a scanning tool makes sense, and a charting tool makes sense. However, uh, if you only trade equities and you don't need mobile alerting, then probably trade ideas will be fine for everything you need. Uh, if you're on a budget and you trade a lot of crypto, then the trade ideas won't be for you, right? So uh, for me, as someone who does this professionally and right, I, I make content and I find tr uh, trend spiders drawing tools better, it makes sense for me to use both. And I'll use both, you know, depending on what I'm doing at the time. Uh, trade ideas, for example, I can put up and I've got a 34-inch monitor uh, vertically here. So top to bottom. And what I'll often do is I will just have it be like 20 charts of just everything on my watch list, all of the individual names. So I'm while I'm working and doing things, I can just glance over and I can take a look at everything that I'm interested in, in the market. You can't do that with TrendSpider, right? So there's, you know, it's like anything, you know, it's what's your tool. If you're an electrician, you're not gonna need just one tool. But if you're a DIYer and you're just like building your own cabinet or something or just playing, then one tool would probably be fine. So right, really just kind of adapt that to what it is that you're planning on doing. But for me, I'll be using both for, I'm sure, the foreseeable future, um, at least until Trade Ideas gets crypto and mobile alerting. Those things are, are big for me. HWC already had earnings, so that's interesting. HWC so earnings are out of the way. It's not very volatile at all. I just do like it's kind of got right anchored view app from the bottom. Again, I can eyeball these in most cases, which is why I don't draw them often. This prior resistance is becoming support kind of in this zone. So that's something to keep an eye on. So if it got up here, maybe just not volatile enough for me, I don't think. Go here. And that's what, you know, if, if somebody had to summarize my trading style quickly, it's I try to identify trends. I try to get a pullback in that trend. And then I try to ride it until it's no longer a trend. And that's it. It's basic. It's boring. But, you know, it is what it is. When it comes to bottom picking, uh, which I don't do very much, 
but NTST, this is a perfect example of something that I may consider, well, I guess it's still pretty strong, but it's a REIT. But for me, I never wanna buy this initial down leg. If we make a higher low on this down leg, I'm way more interested in that. Because again, as I talked about, trends are just a series of lower highs and lower lows. So if this fails to make a lower low and then makes a higher high, well then that's the first time that this trend has kind of changed. So that's what I'm hunting for when it comes to bottom picking. That's the same thing that a big rounded bottom would do for you. But uh, for me, usually a little bit of time for OMC. I don't know what OMC is. What do you guys do? Omicron group. Well, would you look at that? <laughs> Fitting. Uh, advertising agency, 14 billion. So it's in the mid caps, not the small caps, which is good. Uh, earnings a little bit out of the way. Days to cover nine. That's interesting. So days to cover is an interesting way that I'm looking at short float just to say, uh, I think it's more important than the actual just percentage of it. But right, we've got a little bit and kind of what I'm just seeing is I bet you this is pretty close. See, you can almost eyeball these as time goes on. All right, we've got these prior highs right here that it's struggling with, right, to get under. We got this resistance right here. It came up with in my pullback scan, which I've done some, some testing on, and we've got earnings out of the way. So I'd be interested in this one if we could get a little bit further up here. So I'm gonna call that at least 75 and then a 72 stop. And then again, this is something else I can eyeball, but I always suggest when you can't is just draw that out and say, okay, if I'm buying here, my stop's down there, how high does it need to get to until I get to two R? And it's a little bit less than these highs. So I like that, right? It just means I don't, I'm not shooting for the moon to get two times my risk, which is always what I want is just two times my risk. So we'll do watch 75 stop. 72 and then I just add that over to the list so that's one we got one uh, extent. how does VMW work VMW looks okay I, I think you're right you know it, that was a big day for it a nice potential rounded bottom coming up, but you're gonna have resistance kind of 136, right, in this area. So you gotta make sure it's worth that while that you're gonna be able to put your stop somewhere reasonable, that makes sense. And if it gets up to that high, you're gonna be able to make that, you know, at least 1.5 to uh, two times your risk. That one looks okay. I have started work on a rounded bottom scan for the Market Explorer. It's the most promising one that I've tried to date. However, it's not uh, it's not super fancy. It's not great yet, but I'll continue to play. So some of these are interesting. Uh, T and VZ, I think Verizon mostly. They're interesting names to me. And the main reason for that is just if we I do kind of one of these, all right, you see a potential inverse head and shoulders pattern there. The reason I like head and shoulders is for the same reason that I talked about before. If I'm going to pick a bottom, all a head and shoulders is, um, is a potential change in trend, right? You have a lower low, a lower high, a lower low, generally an equal or lower high, and then you have a higher low, and then the thing potentially bounces, right? So just so you know, right, if you, there's nothing mystical about uh, head and shoulders, but it's just saying this is where the trend changes. And that's a, YouTube series I'm going to be doing soon where I'm going to demystify indicators and patterns. I'm going to break every indicator out there and every pattern out there into what is the math say, what is the base thing, try to just dispel all, I found a TTM squeeze 
you know, Ichimoku cross and blah, blah, blah. And I think it's going to make me money. Well, in this series, I'm going to go, this is exactly what that means mathematically. And this is what it's finding because everything's derived off price. So we can go back to price to figure out what it is. So these are interesting to me. I want to see them base a little bit um, up here. I don't want to buy it right under this resistance, but I don't know, looking like it might be time for Verizon to do something, maybe. And the last is WBA. What does WBA do? When is earnings? Walgreens. That's a store down there, right? That's not bad. We've got some resistance here. Maybe we'll add some. I'm obviously Canadian. We don't have these stores up here. How similar is Walgreens to Kroger? I know they're both retail stores. That might sound like a really stupid question, but I'll just feign Canadian ignorance on that. So we'll do like, uh, it's probably around 51. And again, these are obviously really uh, 51, stop, 49. Like shoppers. <laughs> there we go. There's a, one guy who will speak Canadian to me. And that's going to be it for the list. So I'll start doing chart requests now. Um, 51 and 49, not 59. And that's just, um, yeah, so that's going to be the list. What I mentioned earlier and then what's uh, what I added to it. Which we have 10 names on. And that's okay. Kroger is more of a grocery store and... Okay, and Walgreens is a pharmacy. They're probably gonna move pretty closely anyway. All right, can you go over a little bit more days to cover? Sure. Um, so simply put, I have days to cover up here, let me add that. Let me actually remove a lot of this stuff. Let's just look at the two of them. So we're gonna look at short float and we're gonna look at days to cover. All right, so we got those two filters up here. Um, so simply put, a short float, so a float, just to go right into first principles, a float is how many shares the company has outstanding. So. Right, a float could be, you know, let's say there's a million, let's say there's a hundred shares in the float because it's Sunday. Um, that just means that the company issued a hundred shares. So you take the float and you multiply it by the price and that's what the company's worth, right? Think of your Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, it is up here or whatever it's called, where I wanna sell you 30% of my company for blah, blah, blah. That's what a float is, right? So um, Walgreens, for example, I'm assuming is a, big store because it, it looked like it had a big float and there's a lot of shares out there. And those shares are going to be owned by institutions, they're going to be owned by a lot of big places. Um, so the short float percentage just tells you of that float of 100 shares, to make the math easy, how many of them are out there in the market sold short. So, right, given to a broker, the broker then sells it short or gives it to someone else so they can sell it short. So how many shares are owed or, or indebted? And we all know what happens if you get a short squeeze with GameStop and all of that stuff that occurred. Um, short float is good because it shows you how many shares in that short, in that float are short. Uh, when those are low numbers, that's fine. You know, it's just, it's part of the game. I'm not one that thinks shorting is evil or anything like that, but at days to cover, essentially what it does is it takes that short float and then divides it by average daily volume. So, you know, say for example, um, okay, say for example, let's just do a more extreme example. Let's say there was a million shares out there and half of them are sold short. So there's 500,000 
short shares out there in the market. Uh, now, say that's a lot, right? But say the stock does 10 million uh, average daily volume, right? So the it's a really, really active stock. Well, that makes it a little bit less significant because it'd be way easier for those shorts to work out of their positions. The, there's just so much trading going on. But say, for example, of that 100,000 shares that are short, there's only 10% um, of that, or 100 million share, or a million shares in the float, only 10% of that is short. But the stock is incredibly illiquid. It only trades like a few shares a day. The days to cover would be harder. So what the days to cover math actually says is, you know, so 2.51 we're seeing here in Kroger. Uh, so 2.51 means that if every trade in the in a day was somebody covering a short, it would take 2.5 days or two and a half days for all of those shorts to get covered. That's essentially what that means, right? It's going to take that whole time to make sure that those shorts are covered. If that gets up to like 10 or 20 days, then that means even though the short float may be small because the company's a liquid, if there was a, a shock and people had to cover, it could still have that explosive effect. I hope that makes sense. But yeah, so just think of it as short float, the amount of shares that are shorted, divide it by the average daily volume. So it adjusts for the liquidity of the stock. Simple way to put it. All right, so we got some chart requests. We'll go through there. So first is BG. Uh, up a little bit too much to hit support for me, but overall strong trend. Right, we're up a handful of days in a row, smack dab into resistance. So I would be careful of that. MFC. Uh, same kind of thing. Up a little bit too much to get here, but if it clears that resistance, that's interesting. And WU. Uh, this one actually looks pretty nice if you want to do some bottom fishing. Right, you know right where you're wrong. You know, if you break back under this area, probably. That one looks pretty good. Again, if you're into if you're into bottom fishing. Uh, let's put these on screen. My new fancy CTXS. Citrix Systems. A lot of gaps in this one, eh? Uh, you got earnings getting there, so be careful of that. A nice little island reversal. I kind of like this one if it can get over 106. For me, earnings is getting a little bit too close, but that one looks okay. Right, and reversal of trend obviously has happened. You know, if you get above that, that would kind of be your official reversal of trend, but nice looking action compared to the spy. Held up pretty strong. Oh, awesome. That worked. Great. Uh, Walmart. Old Wally World. Walmart. Obvious support, right? Pretty obvious support right down here. Yeah, that's a big level. I like it as long as, you know, you, you've got your line in the sand. My... My theory is you can trade almost anything if you know you're out, right? And you size accordingly to that out. If we were to close under that wick on Walmart, you're probably wrong and it's time to move out. So that gives you a pretty tight risk and then your reward's pretty good. You got 15 days until earnings. So I would watch that. I think retail earnings are going to be kind of interesting. I think they could be really explosive just because, you know, you get... Uh, all the supply chain stuff going on. Uh, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try to guess if it's explosive good or explosive bad. I just think they're going to be, they're going to be wild. So be careful there. But yeah, again, I like anything that you know you're out, and you know it's an obvious support play. Now, what I would warn you against is that we've been getting lower highs throughout here. So right? The sellers are coming in at lower and lower prices. So it might mean your bounce gets hit a little bit quicker, but again, good support type of area. 
All right, guys, I'll leave another little bit for uh, another round of chart requests if anyone has one. If you guys could do me a favor, I hate saying this because it just makes me feel like that stereotypical YouTuber, but if you could like, hit the like button. Um, I appreciate that. It's um, YouTube says, hey, you need to do it if you want people to watch your stuff. So pretty please, if you haven't already, that would help me out. Um, GPN. Plus I get a cool, I wish I, when I drag this on screen, you can't see it, can you? No, this new uh, software, it gives me a little like the thumb up emoji kind of flashes on my screen. It's really like a dopamine hit. JPN's interesting. You got earnings close. You've got a lot, little bit too much of a level for me overhead, to be honest. Right, you've got this is the low right here and then the high right here. I think that's going to be hard. If you can get through and hold above that, that might be the ticket. That might happen after earnings. So that's going to be kind of a concern there for me anyway. I just don't like buying things right before kind of major levels like that. I bet you. Yeah, it's crazy how that works, right? Just nuts. So. Awesome guys. All right, so for Stats Edge Pro people, I'm gonna, I got all the screenshots. I just need to put them in the blog post and write down my thoughts and all that. The watch list is already updated. I will ping our Discord room with that. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. If you wanna, again, leave a like on the way out, that's fine. Links in the description below for my website and all the tools you saw me use today. If you're interested in any of those tools, again, full disclosure, right? They're affiliate links, so they will help me out as well. Uh, thank you everyone for coming down. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We live stream every Sunday at this time. I'm planning on streaming more, but for now, uh, just stay tuned for this time every week and I'll talk to you guys soon.